Welcome to Superheroes of Science. I'm Steven. And I'm Sarah. We co-host Science from the Experts. Our guests are professionals doing cutting-edge science right now. They are experts in their field discussing what they know best. So listen up and learn real science from real people. Subscribe now and stay informed of our latest episodes and show your support. Today we're so excited to welcome back Ken Ridgeway. Ken is a professor of geology and geophysics in the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences here at Purdue University. And we've invited him back for a second talk related to his research uh, with the geo, geophysics and geology. Great. Well, in particular, this is going in a slightly other direction, not just the geophysics, but we're talking about culture here, aren't we? Yes. Absolutely. And, you know, what we're going to be discussing is how do we blend indigenous knowledge? So people that have lived on a land for thousands of years, and how do we incorporate Western science into that in a respectful way? And so that we can bring these communities into the, the universities and decision making and politics and teaching because traditionally a lot of underrepresented groups have been left out of this amazing educational system that we have in the US. And so at Purdue, we've really been focused on reaching out to Native American students and their communities. Um, we can say we have all these scholarships, but if the community doesn't trust you, a lot of these communities, they, they have this heritage of people coming from boarding schools, police taking their kids away from them, putting them in, in boarding schools. So they have this bad connection with American education. And so we're slowly trying to change that. And we're doing that by connecting with communities. So this photo here, we're out in the Southwest and these are all Purdue graduate students. And we're meeting with Native American communities to talk with them about what their needs are. So a very different approach than a Western scientist saying, this is what you need and we need to work on your land to solve this problem. This is more about what's interesting to you, what's important for your community and how can we do it in a respectful way. So at Purdue, um, also working with the Sloan Foundation, we've had over 60 Native American graduate students in the STEM areas that have graduated and they're spread across the country now and they're shown by these stars here. But I say this in a very modest way because our numbers still aren't good with underrepresented communities. So for instance, this is from a recent paper, the number of PhD student degrees granted to Native Americans has increased less than for other URM groups, so underrepresented minority groups. The number of master students in STEM areas for Native Americans has actually gone down. So we've been going out to Native American communities and saying, what's important to you? Who's making the decisions for your communities? And that this impression that science is detrimental to your communities, because often what they see is someone coming in to put in a mine or to drill an oil well, but no, science can actually help you preserve your culture if it's done in the right way, and especially with students from your community. And some of the big issues I've gone around to reservations and native communities since, you know, what's important to you? And these are some of the issues, global climate change, natural resources, energy resources, uh, nuclear waste storage on native lands. But these are all earth science issues. These are our community's issues. And EAPS has an obligation, I feel like, to reach out to all communities to help them solve these problems. So I want to give you an example of the kinds of science problems that Native students are working on. This is Leanna Begay. She was a graduate student here. She's from Tuba City, Arizona. And when I asked her, well, what do you want to do your science project on? And Usually non-Western students will tell me, well, I want to get a job with Exxon or I want to go work, you know, for the EPA in DC. She said, I'm worried about my grandparents on the Navajo reservation to get to the sheep camps. And, and they have a sheep camp at the base of the mountains for the winter. And they just keep moving up the mountains and they're really mesas. Um, midway through the summer, they're about halfway up and then they'll have a sheep camp on top of the mesa. What's happening is that sand dunes are starting to migrate across the reservation. So this is a road by our grandparents' house. 
And this is an active sand dune that's migrating across the road. So she's worried about her family. So this gets back to Native students want to work on things that have an impact on their community. Some of their sheep camps are actually being covered by these active dunes. So this is a sheep camp in the Tuba City area. And you can see the active dune has covered up this, this structure where they used to go and stay with their sheep. So this has a huge impact on the Navajo Nation. As many of you know, right now we're in a big regional drought throughout the Southwest. Colorado River is drying up. California is worried about it. New Mexico is worried about it. California, like who's going to get the water that's still in there? So all these issues, and there's Native communities that depend on this water as well. So Liana used native plants to try to stabilize these dunes. What kind of indigenous plants can we use to help stabilize these dunes? We've had a number of native Hawaiian students and these students are very interested in diet because the Hawaiian people used to have seafood every day. You can imagine if you've ever been here for vacation, there's a lot of ocean around you and it's filled with fish and uh, mollusks. Um, but the question is, their diet has changed by Western influence. And so she wanted to work on the issue of health care and diets. And so she worked with three tribes out in the Pacific Northwest. All these red area areas on the map here are areas where there's native reservations in Washington state. And she worked with these tribes along the coast. These people used to, you know, have razor clams and the time would go out, they'd go out and collect their food. So they had a very healthy diet, seaweed they would harvest. And now they're on the, what we call a commodities diet where the US government, they have extra butter or extra flour that they're subsidizing from the farmers in the Midwest. It goes to native reservations. Um, and so these people have all kinds of diabetes issues and health issues. And so she's working with those tribes to understand the science behind them um, to help them improve their diets. Daryl Reno um, was a graduate student here in our department in EAPS. He's now an assistant professor at Arizona State University, but he comes from Acoma Pueblo. So this is out in Northwestern New Mexico. And this area here is Acoma Pueblo. It's one of the oldest continually lived places in North America. So for thousands of years, Yakima people have lived here and they use the rocks for their everyday living. They, you can see their houses are built out of the same color rock as you have here in the outcrop. They farm on certain parts of it. They go and they, they're beautiful potters. They get, they make pottery from clays within the stratigraphy. And so Daryl said, you know, I would love to go for a graduate degree, Ken, and geology and geophysics, but I want to do something that helps my people. And can you do that with kind of a classic high tech earth science degree? And we came up with a way to do it. So Daryl's research, this is from a poster that he gave at a GSA meeting. He uses, you know, like this is a zircon, so a real small mineral. And you can see we drilled a laser through it to get the age of it. So, um, He's using the high tech science that we have here at places like Purdue, but he also put together a curriculum for the Acoma Pueblo people and the community members. So this is a, a stratigraphic column, how a Western geologist would look at it and say, these layers, this layer is this old, this layer is this old, this is where the dinosaurs are. There's the KT boundary, now we're into mammals. That's how Western science looks at sedimentary rocks. But for Daryl's people, they look at it and say, this is where our natural cisterns are, where we collect water. This is the area, this is the rock unit that we farm in. This is where we get the whitewash for our houses. So it's how the community uses the stratigraphy, these sedimentary rocks, and we can merge those together in a respectful way. And so these ACMA students can start to see, well, if I'm a geologist and geophysicist, there's things that I can add to my community that they, and so, and there's things that their community can teach Western scientists as well. And so we've published papers on this, how to connect geology and Native American culture. 
on, on certain reservations. Right now, we have two students in our group that are working on the issue of drought in the Southwest. As I mentioned before, it looks like we're in the middle of one of these 600 year droughts in the Southwest. And these droughts, we know historically, like you've heard of the Anasazi people, the cliff dwellers. Well, they all moved to the Rio Grande Valley. Now they're the Pueblo people during one of these regional droughts. You know, archeologists can go to fire rings around the old Anasazi dwellings or the ancient ones is what some of the Navajo people call them. They drill down and they pull up a core and they can see that corn cobs are like six inches, six, you know, 600 years ago. And then they're four inches and then they're two inches. So that drought, the corn became smaller and smaller. And then the people just had to migrate away because they couldn't grow food. And so the Navajo want to know, how are we going to survive this? And so to do that, you have to really understand your water budget. And so Derek Slick is working on this problem. And he's from this community. Way Allen's working on this problem. We've been working with our hydrogeologist, Marty Frisbee, and our stable isotope person, Lisa Welp, to understand where the water is coming from in these springs. So here, we're collecting some water from the spring. And this, this one was particularly cool in that we have to go in and we talk with the Navajo elders and we, we tell them what we're doing. And because it's a land-based culture, they use descriptions basically of the land and they can tell us where these springs are that they haven't been to in 50 years. And they'll say, well, in Navajo, what that valley means is water on the sunny side. And then Derek and I will walk for five miles. <laughs> sure enough, on the eastern side of that valley, there's water coming out. And so again, respecting the language and what the language has in these land-based cultures, and then incorporating Western science into it. And the situation has become so bad on the Navajo reservation that they're actually starting to make these earthen dams along the gully. So this is a wash that comes out through here. And what they're trying to do is to dam up the water every time it rains. And you can see they have this fence around here because they're trying to protect that water. There's so many range animals that will come in, but they're trying to feed their sheep and their cattle. Because again, this is a very land-based society. So they'll let their cattle in at a certain time, their sheep in at a certain time. So this looks like a temporary fix, but we're afraid there's been so much evaporation when you do something like this. So we're looking at the water chemistry here and seeing how evaporated is that water chemistry? Because in a way this could be a disadvantage. There might be better ways to retain the water. One issue, as I mentioned, we're working with Professor Lisa Welp on the isotopes. And so we're looking at different plants. So here we're collecting plants and there's two different periods of precipitation out in this part of Arizona on the Navajo Reservation. There's the monsoon, which comes in the fall, which are rains that come up from the Gulf of California. And then you have snow melt, which comes in the winter time. And we wanna know when are plants, when's the critical time that plants are getting water? Because a lot of the Navajo farmers haven't been able to grow corn, this very important plant for them for their food, but also for ceremonial purposes. And so we're using the, the water in the plants to know where that water's coming from because it has different isotopic ratios. So again, these are good examples of how Native American culture and how we can bring Native students to places like Eeps to study Western science and use the tools of Western science to help them preserve their culture, but also to help Purdue learn about how indigenous people that lived on this land for thousands of years. And that knowledge is gonna become more important to us with climate change, with as we have more people on the continent. How do you live on a landscape for tens of thousands of years and, and not overtake from it and how to be careful stewards of that land. It's an important message for all our societies. When we get students to Purdue, Native students, we have to build a home for them, basically. Um, often they're the only Native American student in their, their research group or in their classroom. And so we have activities. So this is at my porch at my house. And 
every fall we have a pumpkin carving party and we meet with the students each week at the Native American Center here that we have on campus. But we have to build a place where Native students can be themselves. And, and this is for all underrepresented students. And we're going to do a good job of incorporating all our society. Mm -hmm. We have to have a place where people are comfortable and, and can feel secure. We go on canoe trips early in the fall. So this is a Cherokee student. So he grew up in North Carolina from the Eastern band of the Cherokee. And we have so much fun on these trips because we have a lot of students from the Southwest that have never been in a canoe. And I, I, I tell them it's gonna be a little shaky sometimes just as I push them off, but sometimes they'll turn over in like six inches of water. <laughs> like what happened? <laughs> and, um, but again, they're learning about what it's like to live in a landscape that's dominated by river systems, just like they can teach us what it's like to live in a landscape where there's very little water. Um, but again, this, this brings us together. The director of the Native American Center, um, Felica Ashton Bryant, and I take Native graduate students around the country to meet with other Native communities. So this is a group of students that we took to Alaska to meet with elders from, uh, you know, Alaska Native elders. And what are the issues that their communities are dealing with? And What's cool about this is that these students are all doing really great things now. Um, the student over here, Mike King, did his master's in our department on air pollution on the Navajo reservation. And now he's teaching other tribes how to monitor the air pollution. He's Navajo and there's these big coal fired power plants. If you've ever been out in the Southwest, most of that power goes to LA, goes to Las Vegas but the native people are taking the impact of that air pollution from it. And they wanna know what impact this is having on our sheep, on our cattle, on our corn. Um, and then Way Allen just graduated or it's close to graduating. She's almost done now. She's doing a postdoc at University of Arizona and she's going to be a professor. And so this is how we slowly change American universities to represent all of us. And, to me, that's the beauty of the concept of America is that everybody has an opportunity. This student, Michelle, grew up in a little island off of the Aleutian Peninsula, so in a native Alaskan community that's based all on salmon fishing. She graduated from Purdue about four years ago from engineering with a PhD. Now she's the first woman engineering Native American person at the University of Alaska. So when you have a person like this in the academic community, it changes the whole set of questions about who's allowed into university settings. What communities are we reaching out to? She is a role model for women, for native people. She also teaches males. Hey, look, look who are the professors in these math dominated, you know, disciplines. So these kind of people change the whole dynamics of, you know, who's allowed here. So what we've learned at Purdue is that Purdue can attract native students, but we have to be proactive. We have to go out to their communities and talk with them about issues that are important to them. They're just not gonna come here based on, well, Purdue is really great in this area or that area. People used to always tell us native students aren't interested in STEM research. Well, you can see that's, that's clearly not the case, but it has to be research that connects to their communities. You have to approach native communities as partners in the research. You have to go out and talk with the elders. You have to ask them how to handle the samples. Sometimes we have to send the samples back to the reservation because they don't want samples. You know, that land is sacred to them and they want those samples back, but they also realize that we can learn a lot from those samples using things like isotope analysis. Um, we have to match Native students with advisors that are really, really willing to learn about the culture. So we have, for a lot of Native American communities, like the green corn ceremony is a really important ceremony for you to be home for. Thanksgiving might not be that important to you. It might even be detrimental in your community, depending on how you interact with the first European Americans. And so we have to be able to tell the professors, you know, the student needs to be home for this period of time, even though it doesn't fit with the Western calendar of how a university works. Um, this 
point about evaluating applications on potential versus pedigreed, a lot of these students, a lot of the native students for their undergrad, they might've had to take off for a year to earn money. Often they're supporting people back home. Um, for some of our, our students, when they come to graduate school, they're making more money than anybody else in their family. Because on the reservation, it's more of a barter system. You have some sheep, I have some corn, we'll trade. And so those students are really coming from impoverished backgrounds in many cases. And so we have to somehow be wise enough to look at the application and say, well, this student didn't go to coding camp, didn't go to math camp, like you know, kids from upper class, middle families can. And we want those kids at Purdue as well. <laughs> but we want everybody at Purdue that has talent and how that talent is manifest might look different in different types of applications. For us, having a cultural center on campus has been a key to getting Native American students here, a place where they can go and be Native and talk about the issues that are bothering them. And we all meet basically once a week and, and talk about what's going on with Native students and how to deal with issues in the classroom, in the labs. Um, and we also have found that summer research programs are important bridges. So when you're bringing a student from a small native community that's on top of a mesa in Northwestern New Mexico, they're pretty cautious about coming to some place like Purdue, 40,000 students, predominantly non-native people. But these bridge programs, they can come here for several weeks, work with a professor, get a feel for what it's like to live in Indiana and what it's like to be at a university. And it helps them make that connection. Okay, I, I, I can do this. I can be here. I can live this far away from my community. So I hope that gives you a feel for how we're trying to reach out to students from other cultures. And in this case, mainly Native American students, but we've worked with other underrepresented groups as well. But that science and engineering, this, this amazing engine of research that we have at Purdue has implications for their communities and can help them become decision makers and political leaders and leaders in their community. And so I'm really proud of what EAPS has done in this area. And um, we're one of the biggest producers of Native American geologists and geophysicists. And so I think each person that you impact impacts 10 other people, or if there are going to be a K through 12 teacher, hundreds of other people. And, and that's how we slowly change our society. And that's, that's what I'm looking forward to. It's, that's something that I've appreciated. Growing up, I did not know. Uh, I mean, I grew up in central Indiana. But uh, once I came here to Purdue, and uh, then especially in this department, there are so many different cultures here that I can, I can learn from and I can, you know, it's, you, it's, it's, I don't know, it's really hard to put into words, the, what an amazing experience it is being allowed to be in a very small way, a part of somebody's culture to learn about different things from their perspective. It's, 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 it's really a humbling experience in a person's life, being able to be included by allowing people to, when they come here, letting us learn something about their culture that uh, I never would have got to learn. It's beautiful, I think. I think it brings out the very best of the human experience. And I feel like before the pandemic, obviously, we used to have dinners where everyone would bring a, a dish from their culture. And it was just amazing because someone would say, you know, well, this is what we have like the Friday after Ramadan. <laughs> and, and, you know, this is the food my family makes for that event. And another person would bring, you know, we eat caribou up on the North Slope of Alaska. And my grandma sent me some caribou and this is how we prepare it. And what, what a, a beautiful learning experience and, and what an appreciation you have for other people and it's within this context that we have at a university where we're about learning and about ideas and about growing as a community. And so it, it really has enriched my life as well, these experiences. I love the emphasis on the synergy between the understanding that Native peoples have for the land and, and, and how they are able to explain the things that happen. And, um, and, but then also 
showing how um, the tools of Western science could help with some of, you know, maybe some problems they're working through. So that synergy between the two, I just think is, is awesome to be able to use both of them to, to make both better, I think. And I think it's really cool in that way, Sarah, because these elders that have all this knowledge, they didn't go to Purdue or I do. Right. They live there and all that knowledge has come from many generations. And so yes. the example that I, I love to use is that, you know, when Henry Hudson sailed up the Delaware Bay and up the Hudson Bay, when he first was going into those areas for the first time we had Europeans, you could see fires that were burning and the natives were burning the forest because they would burn the forest every year and burn their fields every year. And then for 200 years, we didn't burn the forest <laughs> at all. And now we're seeing the impacts because now we have all this dead wood and these. And so now we're going back to systematically burning the forest. But Native people knew about that a long time ago. Right. But we weren't wise enough to listen to what the people that have lived there for tens of thousands of years were doing. Um, it doesn't mean that we can't add things to their culture. It has to be an integrated where everybody brings their best. That's, that's what I love about learning and about being a professor. Yes. I love that. That's, that's awesome. It, it, that's something difficult for people to do. It, it, mm -hmm. It's difficult because you know what you're exposed to. And so if you're not exposed to another culture, it's very hard to envision how they're going to see the simple things is the words you use. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's it, all of these things. And like something I had not really thought of it myself, as you mentioned, uh, the different cultures are going to have importance within their calendar, very different than uh, the Western calendar. And so it, it, we need to make sure that we understand that, be open, that that's a part and importance of their culture. And these are things that it's really hard for, I think, anyone from any culture sometimes to look at another culture and be able to openly be able to um, attempt to understand that because you're ingrained. It's the way we're raised. We're raised that this is how it works and, and, yeah. and, it, and it has worked well for that particular community. But now that we're a global community, yeah. we better start learning from everyone because we have our problems that we have to address, Steve, or global problems. And and we only have one Earth, as you know, and um, we're excited about the sedimentary rocks on Mars and, and other other planets, but that's a long ways away. And we have to, right now we have to live here and this is where our water is and this is where our food is. And so we need to be connected and we need to, again, take the best ideas from every society. And as you mentioned, we have to be humble enough to think, well, I can learn something from this person that's from Papua New Guinea that grew up without any schooling, any Western schooling, but she or he knows what it's like to live in the tropics and to live there sustainably. And, and that's an important lesson for all of us as we have more and more people on the planet. Um, and so, I think earth science has a big role to play in that because we study the soils and we study the rocks that the soils come from. And we have tools to look at how plants are incorporating that, those nutrients into the soil and then how that gets into the atmosphere. So these big systems are the systems that we're gonna to have to understand to, to live wisely on the planet. And um, so while it's a little scary to talk about things like global climate change. It's also an opportunity for us to learn from each other and how we're going to tackle these problems. And you know, human beings have really risen up when there's been big problems. And so it's our turn to do that. Very well said. This is fantastic. I love, I love this. Yes. Thank we we very much appreciate your time. And uh, it's it, this is this is very enlightening. It's, it's awesome. It's awesome to be able to, for us to be able to look into some of the things that you're doing with the different cultures you're doing. And so we very, very much appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for listening to this episode of Science from the Experts from Purdue University Superheroes of Science. If you like this episode, subscribe, give us a positive view and share the love. Boiler up. Hammer down.